God bless you. Thank you for having me again um, in this wonderful church. Now I know how to drive from Oviedo here easy with my eyes closed. No, not with my eyes closed. <laughs> Today we are going to read um, a passage, two verses only, so you won't fall asleep. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. I think it's in your bulletin. We're reading from New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. Let us hear the word of the Lord. One day when I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, son of Mehetabal, who was confined to his house, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, tonight they are going to, they're coming to kill you. But I said, should a man like me run away? Would a man like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, they told me I had about two hours again to preach. No, I'm going to preach on Nehemiah, the whole book like I did in Jonah, remember? But I'm going to give you the most highlighted parts of this wonderful book. There's a concept called branding. Branding is like the commercial reputation of a company. This is what they're known for. So I don't work for any of these companies. I'm not gonna, I don't make any commissions, but I'm going to name some names, and you're going to know who they are because of the concept of branding. When we think of hamburgers, many of us think of McDonald's. When we think of donuts, we think Dunkin'. When we think of soda, we think Coca-Cola. When we, oh, Pepsi. <laughs> when we think of ketchup, well, we think of ketchup. We don't even know the real, the, the tomato thing. It's, that's the name of the company, but we just call it ketchup. When we're going to search online, we Google it. It's even a verb now. You could Google it. When we think of moving trucks, U-Haul. When we think of um, the swoosh, in, uh, in Nike. Nike, right? Just do it. So today, I'm going to talk about just do it, accomplishing a great work or an adventure together. When we think of when my church, and, and, and not my church, but the church I pastored in, um, in Jacksonville and Oviedo, I had um, a motto. The church motto was, no matter who you are or where you're from, you're always welcome. I brainwashed everybody. Everybody knew it by heart. No matter who you are, where you're from, you're always welcome. It was on the bulletin. It was on the business card. Every Sunday we would say it over and over again. That was how we were known in the community. It was such that I, I went and patented it as a trademark in Washington, D.C., so you can't use it. I can sue you. <laughs> when we think of the Presbyterian Church, we think, well, some of us, John Calvin. Well, when you think of the book of Nehemiah, I want you to think of leadership. This is a person who showed us and wrote down things that can help us even today in whatever context that we find ourselves in our lives. Leadership. Some things he did great, other things he didn't do so great. There's some things at the end of the book that I do not agree with Nehemiah, his perfectionism or his legalism or his racist attitude where he separated Jewish families from Gentile families because of his theology, his perspective of the law of Moses. But besides that, there are other things we can learn. We can learn the good, the bad, and the ugly, right, in, in, in every person. But we also can learn some of the highlights of his life. And Nehemiah was an influential person in the Persian Empire. Persia is today Iran. He was a minority immigrant living in a foreign land after Israel, Judah, was taken to captivity, slavery for 50 years in Babylon. And after Babylon, which was Iraq, another empire came, which was the Persian Empire, and they were more benevolent. They, they actually allowed folks who were in their lands to return to their homeland, if they so wished, to restore it or to go back. So Nehemiah had a relative who came by and told them, hey, I went to Jerusalem, I went to our homeland, and things are really bad over there, dreary, awful. 
And Nehemiah, that impacted him, hearing those words from his relative. Now, he had a full-time job. Nehemiah's job was a job that uh, that immigrant was doing. He was born in Persia, but he had a job that many people didn't want to do. He was the cupbearer for the king. You know what the cupbearer was? His function was before the king drank anything, he would drink it first. And if there was poison, too bad, bad luck for Nehemiah. But he was there to try the the cup before the king did. So he had a a really important job, and they trusted him to do that, being a minority immigrant in that foreign empire. And yet he did his, his job well. I don't know if he had life insurance. I hope he did. But... He took his job seriously, and yet he also knew that the information he got from his relative concerning Jerusalem was something that was burdening his heart. And if we want to do, accomplish a great adventure together, there are certain steps that we have to do first. And the first thing we find out in this book is that he saw the need. He saw the need. Chapter 1 Nehemiah sees the need, hears what's going on, and wants to make a difference. Now, there are needs all over us. If you are oblivious to the needs, you're living in a la-la land. But there are needs, and the calling of God is wherever there's a need, that's the calling of God. Sometimes we make God's will so mysterious, but it's not so mysterious. If there's a need, and if there's a willingness and a a capacity to do it, that is what we call the call of God. There are many needs. I can't fulfill all of them, but there are certain needs that I'm good at, that I'm interested, that, have, that I do it with gladness, and that have a, a affinity or capacity to do so, and that is the calling of God upon our lives. Each and every one of us is called by God to meet the needs of others for God's glory. So the first thing he did in chapter 1 is that he started talking to God. He prayed to God. Nehemiah is full of a bunch of prayers. If you read it, he has narratives. And in the narrative, he makes like a pause. And he starts, oh, God, help us. Oh, oh, strengthen our hands. Oh, God, take care of these people. He does that all throughout the book. And in chapter 1, we have the, one of the longest prayers we have in the Bible where he identifies with his people. He identifies with the Jewish people where, who were in captivity and they failed. And he identifies as though he had done that himself. So he prays. He's, he has supplication, adoration, thanksgiving, confession before God, asking God to forgive things that he didn't do, but his forefathers did. He identifies, he talks to God before he does anything else. So that's the first thing we have to do. See the need, talk to God. The second thing that he did was he caught the vision. He caught the vision. The vision was walls restored, workers working, city united. Ezra was a priest and a scribe. Ezra had come before Nehemiah, and Ezra had helped the people, those who were willing to come, because there were a lot of people in, in Persia who didn't want to go. They said, we're not traveling. We're comfortable in slavery. We're comfortable in captivity. We're not going to take that trip. But those who were pioneers, those who had that adventuresome spirit, those who went out, they went before Nehemiah, and they rebuilt and made a second temple. It wasn't as glorious and as beautiful as Solomon's temple, but it was a temple. But they had no protection. The walls of Jerusalem were all destroyed. They had no protection. So what Nehemiah did was he caught the vision. He said, well, we have a a little temple, and now we need protection. We need to get people to work. But before he did anything, his vision was crucial. The vision is what I call the big picture. Uh, Sometimes I call it revision. Sometimes review, revision, revision, see again. A lot of times we have to see things from the balcony, so to speak. Sometimes we have to read the room. In psychology, we call that reading the room, looking from the balcony. 
For example, uh, the illustration is like a dance floor. People are dancing. When you're in the dance floor and you're dancing merengue or disco or rock, I don't know why we dance, right? You, you think, oh, everybody is happy. Everybody is dancing. But when you go to the balcony, you realize from a big perspective, you say, ah, not everybody is dancing. There's someone who's alone over there. There's a couple that's arguing over there. There's somebody who's drunk over there. You realize when you go to the balcony, don't stay in the balcony, but when you go to the balcony, you can see things from a different perspective. But when you're in a mess, when you're in a situation, you only see what's in front of you. Learn to go to the balcony. Get a vision. See the big picture. Every vision has like a promise and a fulfillment. And in between, there's always a threat. I call that something to sabotage. You have the promise. For example, we have Abraham and Sarah were, were given a promise by God. The fulfillment was to have a child and build a nation. The threat was old age. Exodus, God promised the people of Israel that God was going to be with them. The fulfillment was going to be a promised land, liberation. The threat was Pharaoh. Joseph in the Bible, he had a promise, family reconciliation, but the threat was his brothers who were jealous of him. Jesus, the promise, Savior. Salvation, the fulfillment. The threat was religious leaders, the temptation, the desert, Pontius Pilate, you owe, every vision is always going to have a threat. And a vision is basically a dream that's written down. That's a, if you have a dream and, and you didn't write it down, if it's not a plan that's written, it's only a dream. Thank goodness that Nehemiah had a dream and he wrote it down. And today we have it in scripture. He wrote down his plan. He wrote down the vision. I have a a 92-year-old resident where I serve, that she has no diabetes, no glasses. Her heart is great. She's walking around and fabulous. And she came up to me one day. She said, you know what? I found a puzzle box. And I, I had nothing to do that day. So I started putting the puzzle together. And I was amazed at myself. I put the whole puzzle by myself in a half an hour, 30 minutes. And she said, amazing. And then she read the box of the puzzle and said, for, this puzzle is for kids ages three to five years old. <laughs> she was so happy. If you see a puzzle box, you see that before you work on the puzzle, you look at the big picture. That's the vision. So you have an idea how to do it. In a world that's fragmented, in a world that people are doing their own things, it's important that we have the big picture, that we can look at things from the balcony, that we can read the room, that we have a vision. And Nehemiah caught that vision first. That's why he cri cried, he wept, he prayed, he fasted until he caught the vision. The third thing he did Besides seeing the need, talking to God, then he caught that vision, that big picture, that Jerusalem's walls were broken, were turned down, were in dreary condition. The third thing he did was he surveyed the matter. He asked permission from his boss. He says, I can't be, you know, tasting your wine anymore. Can you give me, grant me permission temporarily for me to travel? We're a small group of people to go to my homeland. He went there. And when he, he went there, he inspected every single corner of that place. He knew everything. Sometimes we may have a great vision. Sometimes we may have a heart of compassion to make a difference in the world, meet a need, but we don't survey, evaluate carefully our surroundings. And the Bible says in chapter 2 that he started to survey every single part of that place in Jerusalem. He went to every port. I've been to Jerusalem. They have you know, different ports and things like that, the walls of Jerusalem. And, and he surveyed every gate, 
every port. The Bible says he even surveyed the dung port. I'm not going to explain what that is, but it was stinky. He even went there. He went to the king's pool. Every single, and he rose up late in the night to do this. Before he involved anybody, he prayed, he caught the vision, and he wanted to see for himself. And a lot of times I tell churches that um, our problem about reaching out to the community is not a spiritual problem. Sometimes it's a sociological problem. Sometimes the issue is how friendly are we? How accessible are we? How inclusive are we? What are our first impressions? I passed through one of our Presbyterian church, not this church, obviously, um, and I went, and it's a nice uh, intersection, a lot of cars passed through there every single day, beautiful residential area, and the church, we have one of our churches right there, right smack in the middle of that community. The church is dying. The church is stagnant. Everybody passes that church and ignores the church every single day. And now I know why. It's not a spiritual problem. It's a sociological problem. Because when I went through that church, I wouldn't stop there neither. You know why? The grass was yay high. The signage was missing. I didn't know if it was 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock, or 11 o'clock when the church started because the sign was missing a letter. Details. Surveying. Know your community. And I believe that there's like a, I don't know if this is scientific, but there's a 10,000 hour rule. If you do something for 10,000 hours, no matter what it is, which is the equivalent of a full-time job Monday through Friday, 40 hours a week for five years. If you do something for five years, 10,000 hours, you become an expert in it. It becomes second nature. Remember when you started driving a car the first time, you, you were nervous, didn't know how to turn, and now you drive the car with one hand, you think you're cool? No, no, many of you don't do that. But some people start texting and doing other things. We shouldn't do that. Right? We become so confident because we think we've been doing it for so long. I know some people who console things with their eyes closed almost. We do things and we do this constantly, drawing, driving, musician. We could do it almost Second nature. And I believe if we do what God has called us to do, we, we become a loving church. It just becomes second nature, just part of our DNA. It's who we are. I went to a dentist one time, and, and, and they had to take my wisdom teeth out, and I was nervous. And the, the surgeon, he was, he was all casual. He took pliers, literally pliers. And he was like put injections real fast. In 10 minutes, he took three of my wisdom teeth out. Ten minutes, and he took, and he was talking. When he was talking about other things while he was doing that, he had done that so many times, more than ten thousand hours is second nature. So I believe that we can learn from Nehemiah, where he evaluated, rose up early, and checked out everything first. He took the initiative. When was the last time you did something without being told? You just took the initiative. And mind you, Nehemiah was not a prophet. Nehemiah was not a priest. Nehemiah didn't want to have aspirations to be a king. Nehemiah was a lay person. He was no preacher. He was not ordained. He was a cupbearer. The fourth thing we can learn from this book is look for helpers. Remember Mr. Rogers? Whenever there's evil in the world, look for helpers. Good people, good churches have good goals, but they fail because sometimes they try to do the job alone. Nehemiah was not a carpenter, but he, he was a good administrator. He was able to involve other people, motivate others, the art of sharing news and also delegating authority so that others, a core, small group of people who had the same heart, saw the same need, had the same interest, the same capacity to make a difference, they came together and they did wonderful things because they inspired one another. So I think we can learn from Nehemiah by trying not to do things on our own. 
And in your life, I always said, I don't know if I said it last time when I came here, you should have at least two people in your life that you can talk to. And sometimes they have to be somebody besides your family. Because the problem sometimes is your family. <laughs> two people in your life that you can talk, you can call at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't have to apologize. That can be in your life. That can, they love you, but they'll tell you the truth. You need people like that in your life. Don't try to be a Christian by yourself. It's not going to work. Don't do it alone. Look for helpers. And the fifth thing that we can learn from this, what he did, besides catching a vision, seeing the need, uh, praying to God, surveying the matter, right, looking for helpers, then anticipate opposition. Persist when opposed. Every vision is going to have opposition. And that's the passage we read in Nehemiah chapter 6. Every single time they had the good purpose, they want to come, uh, rebuild the, the walls of Jerusalem, and you know there's always going to be someone who's going to gossip. They started talking behind their back. They started ridiculing them, criticizing them, and even threatening them, extorting them, saying, hey, we just read, you need to run to the temple they're coming after you. They sent a letter. Oh, we hear that you want to be king, Nehemiah. And that's why you're rebuilding the temple. And we're going to report it to our king, the Persian emperor, and let him know your intentions. And they started talking all these things, threatening them, lying and saying, run to the temple of God. And I like the classic response from Nehemiah that we read. It's one of my favorite verses. In verse, six, uh, verse 11, chapter 6, he says, Should a man like me run away? Would a man like me go into the temple to save his life? I would not go in. Another version, Revised Standard Version said, should a, should a person as I flee? New Living Translation says, Should someone in my position run away from danger? The message paraphrase says, why would a man like me run for cover? And why would a man like me use the temple as a hideout? I won't do it. That's called thick skin. Every time you have the best intentions, you got to anticipate that the honeymoon will be over. You got to anticipate that opposition will occur. They even use anti-Semitic racist language to, to try to depress, to try to discourage them. In chapter 4 of Nehemiah, verse 1 through 3, it says, Now when Sambalot heard that they were building the war, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates, What are these feeble Jews doing? Hear that? Feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heap of rubbish? Burn ones at that? And then you always have someone else who's gossiping too. And Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, that stone wall that they are building, any fox going up on it would break it down. And Nehemiah chapter the next verse, he says his prayers. Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their own heads. So anticipate, and I like the way he responds. At this stage of my life, you think I'm going to run away? When the going gets tough, you think now I'm going to leave? No way. So what he did was, okay, we're going to work. We're going to work smarter. We're going to work harder, and we're going to try to complete this because they're threatening us, and we're going to have every worker have a sword on their side and work with their hands, and no one is taking a bath. Imagine that. I'm OCD. I'll go crazy. Can't take a bath. No one is going to take a There's no time to take a shower. We are going to work. We are going to persist in the midst of opposition. No taking a bath. Everybody has a sword while you're working, constructing, building the temple, I mean, the, the, the walls of Jerusalem, and they did that. 
It reminds me when I was in college, um, there was a church that wanted to start a bus ministry. And I, I, I came to church through a bus ministry. Um, there was a church, a bus ministry at that time, they had school buses and churches would go to the communities and bring people, bus kids on Sundays. And this church, when I was in college, was doing that. I'm like, yes, I want to pay it forward. That's how I came to church. I, I was born in an reli- unreligious, irreligious, dysfunctional home. I was the f- only one that went to church, 11 years old. I had no support from my family. And I saw how that church helped me. And now I'm in college. I'm in Texas, out of all places, a guy from New Jersey in Texas. Right? And I'm in Texas, and this church is starting a bus ministry. I said, ah, oh, this is right smack in my heart. I'm going to pay it forward. And I, I, I wasn't a member of that church. I said, it was right. I didn't have a car, so I just volunteered. And I said, sign me up. I want to help out. And we went Saturdays to visit different communities, invite kids, talk to parents, and tell, tell them, on Sunday at this time, we're going to pick you up on a bus. The first Sunday we came, we had so many kids waiting that we had to get cars from other university kids to try to bring those kids to the church. We were so excited, and for months, things were going great and, 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 and fantastic until you have people talking, gossipers, not in this church, but you, and gossipers, people complaining, all oh, the kids now that are coming on Sundays, they're making too much noise. Oh, the carpet. Oh, my goodness, they're ruining the carpet. All oh, these kids are, have a different skin color, different language than us. They're going to mess up our good Christian um, children from our church. A little tinge of racism. And they started all this complaint. And I didn't do what Jeremiah and Nehemiah did, persist. I just quit. I said, I'm not going to deal with this. I can't deal with racist attitude and where people are more interested in a carpet than they are in people and children that are coming to church. So I did, sometimes it's, it's a Christian response to say yes is a Christian response to say no too. You learn, to, learn how to say no. It's called boundaries. And I said no. But I helped in other. I went to another church and helped them in other. I always been involved in church. So I didn't quit church. I'm just saying I didn't want to support a ministry that had that such attitude. Everything was grander. Everything was great until people started complaining. And they forgot their purpose, the big picture. They lost the big picture. They didn't look everything the puzzle. They forgot to look at the box. So Nehemiah told them, we got the vision of God. We are going to persist. We're going to pray. We're going to prepare. We're going to protect. We're going to do what we need to do. Even though they're coming, lying, telling us they're going to kill us, extort us, and saying all kinds of things against us. And the sixth thing that we can learn is just do it. They finished it. They completed the task with determination, hard work, You know how long it took them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem? Working 24-7, not taking a bath. You know how long it took them? 52 days. 52 days. They completed the task. What a feat. And after they completed it, Nehemiah called the priest Ezra, who is actually a very important figure in Scripture, although behind the scenes he probably wrote a lot or compiled a lot of our Scriptures without even knowing 1st or 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd King. I think the hands of Ezra is, is on that as an editor. And Ezra came along with scrolls and he started reading for the first time before those people, they never had a Bible. People didn't carry Bibles. They didn't come afford that. They didn't have paper. That. He, wrote, he read a scroll of the Bible in Hebrew. And they didn't even know Hebrew. They were living, remember, in, in Babylon, the, the language was Aramaic. So they had translators. People translating as Nehemiah was reading the Bible. They were translating and people started crying. People started weeping. And then Nehemiah said, take a bath. People took a bath. People came. And they started doing some of my favorite activities, which is 
eating. They started eating. Who loves to eat? Love to eat. They started eating, sharing, singing, listening, hours and hours reading. Now, people get bored now, right? I got to watch out, make sure no one goes to sleep here, right? But Nehemiah, without no PowerPoint, without any sound effect, he just read scripture and people were attentive because for the first time they were hearing literally the words of God in scripture. They never had that before. And they brought a revival. And they finished the job. Sometimes, you know, there was a YouTube uh, video that somebody uh, sent me. It had um, um, a turtle and a rabbit. And you know the, the story about the turtle and the rabbit? And it's actually true. The myth is actually true. Because the rabbit was trying to, you know, it's like a race between who comes first, right? Who's going to win the race? And the rabbit was all over the place in the video. He went going this way, that way. And the turtle was real slow, but persistent and kept on. And finally, you know who won the race? The turtle. Just kept on going. The rabbit was sleeping, doing other things, being distracted by people who were there. And sometimes we could slow but steady wins the race. So don't quit. Don't quit on, in life. Don't quit in what God has called you as a people to do. Recognize that you're a child of God. Pray for the needs of your community, your family. Catch God's vision. Survey the task that needs to be done. Share it with someone or people who can help you. Persist over all opposition and just do it. Finish it. Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says the following. This is the message paraphrase. I like the way Paul says this in this translation. I'm not saying that I have it all together. Anybody here has it all together? Not me. I'm not raising my hand. That I have made it. I'm not saying that I have made it. But I am on, I am well on my way reaching out for Christ, who has so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in all of this. But I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward to Jesus. I'm off and running and I'm not turning back. Now, remember I told you about branding? That in the church where I pastored since 1997, we had the saying, no matter who you are, where you're from, no one, everyone is welcome. Well, I had a member of our church who, who was assigned to open the church every Sunday, early in the morning, to check the bathrooms and open the church, get get it ready. And he was a great Christian, a good Christian, but he had his temper. He had his attitude issues. You know, there's some Christians that have those issues. So I told him, don't socialize too much with people. You give me more problems. You know, just open the church by yourself. You know, open the church. He could do that. He can handle that. But dealing with people, oh my goodness. So one day he's opening the church and there's a person, we had a canopy between the church, sanctuary, and the educational building. And in between that canopy, we had a bench, like a wooden bench that you have like in the sanctuary here. And he found a homeless person. Well, not a homeless, a houseless person. Because there's a difference between homeless and houseless. There's some people who have a house and they're homeless. And there's some people who don't have a house. And are looking for a home. This was a houseless person who was there laying down, sleeping. And his first impression... His, you know, the way he was, was, I got to get this, kid, this guy out of here. He stinks. I got to get him out of here. We're getting, kids are coming to church, and we got to do things and get ready. And then he remembered branding. He remembered. No matter who you are or where you're from, you are always welcome here. And that saying changed his attitude towards that man. And he woke him up welcomed him to the church, invited him to the service, asked him if he wanted something to eat, got, went across the street to Hardee's or whatever you call it, it's not good for your cholesterol. He went over there, got it for him, and became a friend to this person. Not only just like an anonymous person, but someone that he talked to, treated him like a human being. He started coming to our church regularly. 
Because this person who I thought was the least capable person of dealing with others because of interpersonal skills was the one who remembered no matter who you are, where you're from, you're always welcome here. And that changed. I saw his growth. I saw him grow at that moment. And I hope that we can do the same. I hope that we can have present in our lives that no matter what we're going through, God is with us and persist in the midst of any opposition. Amen?